Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, apologies for uh, starting this uh, first quarter of uh, financial year 2021-2022. Uh, I hand over now to uh, Mr. Srikant Venkatachari, who would uh, start with the uh, overall uh, performance of the company for this quarter, uh, and he will be followed by Kiran and uh, Ashwin, who will uh, talk about digital services part of our business, followed by Dinesh Thapur, who will present the uh, detail section, and uh, Sanjay Roy will talk about the inspiration of the business, and Srikant will come up and talk about the O2C and the business. What do you think about Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a little sorry about the delay uh, in this. So, like in usual, uh, we will do the first uh, uh, you know, seven, eight minutes on the consolidated numbers and then do the individual businesses. So, moving to the first slide. <clears throat> so, uh, it's, it's been a record uh, quarterly EBITDA, strong performance in O2C and digital services. Our EBITDA is at 27,550, is up 28 percent. Net profit also on a pre-exceptional basis at 13,806 crores, uh, which is 67 percent higher. And this is on the back of uh, normalized tax provision. When you look at O2C, uh, this is the fourth uh, sequential quarter of growth. A significantly lower impact of second wave uh, as compared to the first one. And uh, we believe that demand is on track. And in the next one to two quarters, uh, we, we see that kind of recovery. Retail was uh, definitely impacted by uh, restricted store operations. Of course, we were able to mitigate to some extent by ramping up our uh, digital commerce. On the digital side, uh, we continue to see a good traction in subscriber growth as well as data usage. In some sense, I would say not affected by second wave, uh, barring some of the FTTH uh, rollouts, which uh, did get impacted. Uh, the fact that our network was superior uh, and uh, very high customer engagement helped. On the oil and gas side, uh, the benefit coming from ramp up of KGD6 production, all our strategy growth initiatives are on track. Uh, when you look at the uh, numbers, you can see that uh, the revenues uh, are there has been a strong year-on-year -year growth, uh, up 57%, uh, as well as profits that we saw. Um, overall, uh, when you look at quarter-on-quarter -quarter revenues, it is lower by 8%, and uh, that is uh, because of curtailed uh, retail operations. It was, uh, uh, you know, uh, to some sec uh, section, I mean, for, it was offset to a great extent because of uh, higher realization in O2C, as well as the KGD6 uh, ramp-up. Um, and the uh, uh, overall EBITDA was improvement uh, clearly led by O2C, uh, digital, and oil and gas, uh, which helped to offset actually the uh, retail uh, weaknesses. Um, on the on the finance cost, uh, you know this would be the fourth uh, consecutive quarter of uh, lower finance costs. So now finance cost is 50% lower on a year-on-year -year basis, and 16% lower on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, and that is. Um, on the uh, back of uh, uh, the fact that we have been able to repay our liabilities on the back of uh, capital inflows, as well as a very proactive uh, optimization of our uh, liability cost. When you look at PBT, uh, yeah, the, the benefit of uh, better EBITDA, as well as lower finance cost, uh, you know, translates itself in PBT growth, both on a year-on-year -year basis, as well as on a, a sequential basis. On the tax side, uh, uh, you know, the amount the tax amount is uh, higher on a year-on-year -year basis as well as on a Q-on-Q -Q basis. This is because uh, tax provision in this financial year is at a normalized level. So even after considering this, the pre-exceptional net profit, uh, 13,806 crores, um, is 67% higher on a year-on-year -year basis and only about 2.8% uh, lower on a Q-on-Q -Q basis. So in summary, uh, strong operating performance uh, despite the pandemic imposed uh, challenges. Next slide. So this is just the breakup of the EBITDA and we will see it in the subsequent quarters, but uh, you know, strong operational performance, uh, you can see O2C up 50% uh, year on year and also sequentially up on uh, by 7.2%. Uh, we benefited from a very favorable margin environment as well as uh, optimization in our feedstock and uh, energy costs. Uh, retail uh, sharply lower at 46% because of uh, curtailment of store operations. 
and lower footfalls, but compensated by uh, good uh, traction in our omni channel. Our digital uh, services, uh, both up uh, uh, sequentially as well as year on year, maintained, uh, you know, we maintain customer addition as well as uh, very strong uh, usage growth that we will see. Um, and uh, on the oil and gas side, uh, uh, 66% jump uh, Q on Q on the back of uh, ramp up of KGD6. So benefiting really from a diversified business mix. On the balance sheet side, uh, you know, we continue to have more uh, cash uh, than debt and the levels are slightly higher than what we saw in March uh, by, and it's, it's 3861 crores. Um, so, uh, in, uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, we have a very strong balance sheet. We have a very strong uh, cash flow generating businesses, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, will help us in our growth in initiatives and to drive long-term value. Uh, just one, uh, a few slides on uh, each of the businesses before I hand over to uh, Anshuman. Um, overall, when you see the uh, uh, the O2C environment for demand and margin, very strong growth in demand. We are seeing that reflected in transportation margins, which are at a four to six quarter high. We are also seeing that kind of uh, strength in downstream uh, chemicals. Um, uh, Q on Q, uh, domestic demand for fuels has been impacted. Uh, uh, and uh, in the in the O2C section, uh, I, I'll make the case that uh, why it is uh, uh, you know it's, uh, compared to Q1 last year, why the impact has been very muted in as far as O2C is concerned. Um, but when you look at it on year on year, obviously there is strong demand growth across. From an operational standpoint, uh, we saw the numbers uh, uh, EBITDA uh, 12,231 uh, crores, which is up seven percent. QOQ as well as our almost 50% year on year. We had higher uh, feedstock uh, going through. Uh, we were able to optimize uh, light uh, feed cracking. Uh, uh, you know, we were able to very swiftly flex our business model uh, moving from domestic to exports when uh, you saw the wave to come through. Uh, and also uh, uh, benefiting again uh, from energy cost optimization because a lot more of, you're accessing a lot more of domestic gas. Next slide. Uh, on the digital services, uh, you know, uh, the healthy growth uh, of customers, 14 million plus, uh, with uh, taking our total customer base to 441 million. Our churn rates have declined. It's below one now at 0.95. Um, we are also seeing a very strong growth in as far as per, per uh, customer utilization. It is up 18% to almost 15.6 GB. Uh, we were, we've benefited from the ramp up in infrastructure and the customer focus right through uh, this quarter. And uh, when you look at it from overall, uh, therefore, the revenue standpoint, um, uh, you know, 18% growth year on year in RJL revenue, EBITDA up uh, 21%, and our EBITDA margin now at uh, close to 47%. On the retail side, uh, uh, beyond doubt, uh, uh, there has been uh, significant restrictions have that has definitely disrupted our stores and logistical operations. Footfalls at 46% of pre-COVID. This is very similar in some sense to how how it was in Q1. And uh, while sentiment is reviving, it I would say we characterize that as being uh, cautious. Uh, but having said that, we continue to grow more than 100 stores, and uh, actually we have 700 stores which are uh, fit uh, fit out ready uh, at this point in time. Uh, vaccination overall, uh, you know, uh, we have done very well and more so in the context of retail, a lot of front front end facing staff there. Uh, we have vaccinated 99% plus of the people. On the revenue side, uh, uh, gross revenues at 38,000 crores, uh, up 22% year on year. Um, and EBITDA at 1941 uh, crores is about 80% year on year, though sequentially it did fall by about 46%. The big uh, push here uh, has been, uh, or the drivers have been really on electronics and fashion, where uh, we, we saw better trading conditions compared to last year. And uh, the, the scaling up of our digital uh, commerce and merchant establishment has come in very useful. Now they contribute to almost 20% of our uh, retail sales. And uh, with this, uh, I'm handing it to Anshuman. Uh, I'll kick it off, uh, Srikant, Kiran here. Yes, sorry, Kiran. Yeah. No problem. 
So I think uh, uh, getting into digital services, a quick uh, highlight for the quarter. Some of it uh, Srikant mentioned, but again, highlighting here. The connectivity business is continuing to uh, sustain the momentum of growth. Um, we closed this quarter with a total customer base of 440 odd million customers. And uh, in the, in the uh, last quarter, we have added uh, on a net basis 14.3 million customers. Uh, overall data traffic on Geo's network uh, crossed uh, 20 exabytes for the quarter. So 20 exabytes would be 20 billion gigabytes uh, for the quarter. ARPU is pretty stable at uh, around 138 uh, rupees. Um, even though the subscriber count has been increasing steadily, the ARPU has been pretty stable. Um, there's been a very clear focus on ramping up our infrastructure and uh, especially uh, operationalizing the additional spectrum that, that we acquired recently, as well as a, a number of customer focus initiatives, all of which have contributed to uh, a, 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 a real increase in the customer experience and therefore the customer engagement and utilization uh, of, of geo services. In spite of COVID uh, related challenges, the financial performance has been pretty strong. The revenues are at 18,000 crores, which is a year-on-year uh, -year growth of nearly 20 percent. Uh, the JPL EBITDAs are up uh, nearly 21 percent year-on-year to now reach uh, 8,892 crores uh, with, with a nearly 47 percent EBITDA margin. Uh, also significant are some of the key partnership announcements that we have made in the last quarter. Uh, the most prominent of them was with Google to uh, use Google Cloud uh, to power Geo's own 5G solutions, which we'll talk about in a minute, as well as for, for uh, sustaining a lot of growth that we are seeing in uh, multiple of our sectors, uh, spanning retail, uh, both the traditional retail as well as Geo Mart, uh, and in a number of digital services, uh, prominently Geo Savan uh, in music and Geo Health. Uh, it is not just uh, the, the hyperscale cloud, but also the relationship is extending to uh, the edge cloud infrastructure that Google Cloud is uh, is setting it up, and uh, the idea being that when when we talk about low latency solutions like 5G, uh, edge becomes very important, uh, especially in use cases like gaming, uh, video entertainment, and so on. So again, we'll be looking not just to deploy our 5G, uh, our own 5G uh, components, but also to work very closely with Google Cloud to develop uh, edge use cases uh, based on 5G. Likewise, uh, the, the relationship with Microsoft that we had announced uh, uh, last year, uh, that is now reaching a stage of early operationalization. We have already operationalized 10 megawatt uh, capacity of uh, Geo Azure cloud data centers. To remind everybody, our partnership was to jointly create a cloud infrastructure uh, for India uh, using the Azure uh, so capabilities, but uh, Geo building the infrastructure to power that. So 10 megawatt of initial capacity has been created in, 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 in two locations, Jamnagar and Nagpur. Uh, we are currently uh, bringing on certain pilot customers who can start using that uh, to, to run their workloads and uh, planning and work is already underway to enhance that capacity over the coming quarters. Uh, similarly, we have uh, uh, an announcement that uh, we had announcement that we had made with on the partnership with WhatsApp. Uh, some of the early use cases are now already in the market. There is, of course, a lot of exciting work which are ongoing, uh, but uh, talking about uh, some of the use cases that we have already launched, uh, certainly the ability to recharge through WhatsApp using the, the WhatsApp bot framework is already uh, operational. Uh, we do make uh, recommendations to our, uh, the smart bots are able to recommend the top three plans that customers may want to choose. Uh, and uh, likewise, uh, uh, reminders for recharge as well as uh, all the other notifications, uh, WhatsApp is being increasingly used as a channel. Uh, again, this is just the uh, early part of the engagement. There's a lot more joint product development work that we're doing, all of which uh, will be unveiled in the coming quarters. Um, just to also highlight that it has not always been uh, purely about business growth. Uh, there were a lot of initiatives that we launched keeping in mind uh, the need to alleviate 
the the hardships and the and and the pain and suffering being experienced across the country uh, one of the one of the concepts that we launched uh, in the last quarter was targeted at our geo phone users who are typically from the bottom of the pyramid economic pyramid uh, we found that a lot of people were finding it difficult to make uh, regular data recharges but uh, we thought we should extend an arm that even if there is uh, some delay but we continue to offer up to 300 minutes of outgoing calls uh, for all geo phone users uh, so that they are never disconnected if they have to make an emergency call or, or reach out to near and dear ones uh, and also when they do the data recharge we ensure that if they are buying one we are also giving an extra recharge uh, because in, in these trying times you never know when they when that might come handy also from a data loan even if they run out of data uh, you can, we, we were offering something called emergency data loan where they can continue to use data for some time until they are able to get to a recharge um, uh, whenever whenever next convenient to them uh, also the network itself uh, we have we have been uh, very fo in a very focused way uh, increasing our network capacity uh, like i mentioned a little bit earlier we recently acquired additional spectrum in the auctions that happened and i'm glad to report that uh, nearly almost all of that spectrum has been operationalized uh, resulting in a very significant uh, increase in customer experience that we've been able to notice uh, right across everything from indoor coverage to download speeds to video experience and so on uh, a large chunk of customers are now uh, the vast majority of customers are able to get uh, in excess of 10 megabits per second speed um, and uh, we also find that uh, this additional capacity has unlocked a, a nearly 26 percent year-on-year increase in per capita consumption to now over 15 and a half gbs uh, per month per customer uh, also in, interestingly what this additional spectrum investments have done in addition to uh, increasing the customer experience it has also created an additional step change in capacity which we believe will hold us uh, in good stead to onboard up to the next 200 billion customers on our network Uh, also, um, uh, talking about a, a significant innovation that our engineers have been able to make, uh, which is Geo 5G. Um, and, and what Geo 5G uh, is, is a complete end-to-end -end 5G stack, uh, which has been developed uh, 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 within in-house by uh, Geo engineers, which is completely cloud-native, which is fully software defined and uh, and and end to end managed so not just the 5g components themselves but also the entire management framework to manage such a complicated network all of those have been built internally um, uh, as you also know many of you may know that we have also now received the approvals and the trial spectrum to initiate 5g field trials and uh, we are initiating this using our own uh, geo 5g stack that we have developed internally so we have, we have we have received uh, 100 megahertz in the 3.5 gig band also called the n78 band which dot has uh, allocated uh, for trials uh, all, the entire network which is also uh, quite satisfyingly what we call a standalone in a standalone mode so not as an overlay on 4g but a purely standalone 5g capable network all the components are now installed in all of the data centers across our country and uh, uh, obviously because of the fact that we are a zero legacy network uh, we'll be able to as soon as we get the operational spectrum be able to quite quickly and seamlessly uh, upgrade uh, uh, our offerings uh, from 4g to 5g we are also working to, to build certain what uh, what we call showcase applications in, in in various verticals everything spanning from healthcare to education uh, entertainment and retail uh, specifically uh, highlighting the capabilities of 5g uh, one of the examples is uh, a 5g connected uh, ambulance that we are developing so that all the capabilities of an emergency room hospital emergency room can be extended to uh, an ambulance no matter where it is uh, at any point in time this we are doing in collaboration with our hn reliance foundation hospital similarly ability to deliver rich uh, augmented reality and virtual reality content again taking advantage of the low latency high bandwidth capabilities of 5g to uh, students uh, at home as well as in the classroom and again we are developing these concepts uh, together with reliance foundation uh, school all of these would hopefully showcase enough of those capabilities and in addition to delivering these use cases also prompt other 
ecosystem partners also to step up and uh, use the 5G capability that we are creating to come up with uh, literally hundreds and thousands of innovative solutions like this. Uh, GeoFiber continues to build traction. Uh, I think uh, as Srikant mentioned uh, in his preamble that uh, because of COVID uh, and the fact that GeoFiber requires a lot of physical activities both uh, on the streets as well as within buildings and homes, uh, this has been uh, obviously a challenging year uh, for for such work, uh, but in 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 spite of that, uh, I'm glad to uh, to report that GeoFiber today is now used by more than three million connected homes, and uh, and obviously as things are improving, as we're coming out of the phase two, um, fingers crossed, there you know this will pick up and uh, we'll have a strong ability to increase this base uh, in the coming coming days. Uh, but of course, all the uh, work which we were doing in the public spaces, uh, fortunately, that was not as impacted. And today, uh, Geo's optical fiber is physically present outside more than 12 million premises. So what that means is as soon as the COVID situation improves, the ability to connect, convert, to convert those uh, proximities into actually consuming customers is extremely high. Engagement metrics uh, for those people who already have Geo fiber, we have been seeing a steady improvement. Uh, for example, on average, uh, a geofiber home consumes nearly 300 gigabytes of data every month, and we are seeing that month on month, this uh, trend is going up. Uh, and in terms of engagement, we also have a set-top box offering that we are offering. It's a, a, a something that connects to your TV, and you have the the large screen experience that we have created through this box. And we are finding that we are we are experiencing more than five hours of engagement uh, on average per household. Uh, again, multiple devices uh, are, are connecting because uh, we extend Wi-Fi in the home on the back of fiber. And on average, we are seeing uh, up to half a dozen devices per home, and these numbers are again increasing. So it's a winning product. I think now it's a question of uh, physically deploying as the situation, uh, the macro situation improves across the country. Again, you can see uh, the momentum is continuing from a, from a customer base perspective. Again, to highlight, uh, in June of last year, we were a shade under 400 million. Uh, today we are at 440 million. Uh, data traffic, like I mentioned, we were at 14 exabytes or 14,000 crores uh, GBs uh, uh, for the quarter. And you can see that uh, we are exiting now at nearly 20 exabytes, which is a 40% increase year on year. Uh, from an operating uh, uh, metrics perspective, again, I'm not repeating the, the customer base, but in terms of net additions, uh, uh, last year, uh, similar quarter last year, we added nearly 10 million customers. That has now grown to 14 million net additions this quarter. ARPUs are holding quite steady quarter on quarter. Uh, data consumption, uh, 14,000 crores to 20, uh, 2,000 crores. Uh, per capita, again, from uh, shade over 12 GB uh, per customer per month to now in excess of 15 GB per customer per month. In terms of voice minutes, uh, a shade under 1,000 crore minutes per day that we were carrying on our network to now in excess of uh, 1169 crore minutes per day. And even on a per capita basis, that number has grown from uh, nearly 750 minutes per user per month to now uh, in excess of uh, 800 uh, minutes per month. So overall, it shows uh, a, a, an increasing customer engagement, a growth in the customer base, uh, and obviously, um, growing consumption and therefore growing revenues uh, when it comes to uh, the connectivity uh, part of our business. Maybe at this point, I'll hand it over to Anshuman, who can uh, just walk us through the financials as well. Thanks, Kiran. Um, so I'll quickly summarize the financial performance for the quarter, starting first with um, uh, RGIL, uh, the connectivity business, where we reported revenues of 17,994 crores for this quarter, uh, which on a like-to-like -like basis was an 18% growth over the same quarter last year. Um, the dip in March 21 that you see is on account of the IUC regime moving to bill and keep. Uh, the EBITDA also showed an uh, upward growing trend. Uh, we had RGIL had a EBITDA of 8,631 crores for the quarter. That was a 19.3% growth year on year with a 48% EBITDA margin. So the margin has been uh, holding uh, fairly steady. Even um, you know, even though we've been expanding network capacity, we added more spectrum. 
Moving on to the Geo Platforms Limited financials. These are consolidated financials at the Geo Platform uh, Limited level um, and include the RGIL as well as other subsidiaries. We had operating revenues of 18,952 crores for the quarter. Uh, we an EBITDA of 8,892 crores. The EBITDA margins uh, again was steady at 46.9 percent, or 4.4 percent uh, uh, higher than the same quarter of last year. Now this quarter it, it was important for us. Um, this is an important one because uh, of the tough circumstances on the ground uh, with the second phase of COVID, where in April and May we had a lot of challenges on the ground. There were things beyond the normal call of duty that we were doing, and and expenses went up also because of, uh, you know, uh, we did uh, give out um, benefits to customers given the tough circumstances. Uh, Kiran spoke about uh, uh, the geophone offers that we gave away during the quarter, yet we managed to hold on to the bidder margin and that was good. Um, EBIT at 5,727 crores and net profit grew 44.9% year on year to 3,651 crores for the quarter. Uh, moving on, um, uh, just a slight summarizing, um, um, you know, the thoughts at this point in time. Uh, this was a tough quarter for the business because of uh, COVID-related disruptions. Um, you know, the on-the-ground uh, situation was not good, especially April and May, both months. We, uh, you know, and even now the recovery is just about beginning. It's, um, you know, there's still hopefully things will keep getting better, but it was a tough quarter uh, in that in that perspective. Uh, the However, that doesn't, you know, from our point of view, we are very optimistic about uh, the overall demand scenario and our ability to service that demand. Uh, and uh, that is where, while there have been challenges and uh, delay in incremental monetization of our FTTH and digital platforms, but we see a long runway ahead of us, both on the mobility side with with what we have done with our network capacity and devices, 5G rollout, and even on the fiber uh, to the home and enterprise side where the demand has been extremely strong. Um, and uh, our services have been taken up wherever possible to render those services have been taken up and, and customer traction has been extremely high. So hopefully if things keep improving, uh, we will see uh, more traction on uh, with our products um, on the field. So that, uh, you know, with that, I'm going to hand over to Dinesh to take you through the a summary of the results uh, of the of Reliance Retail. Thanks, Anshuman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before I get started to talk about the performance of Reliance Retail, a few comments on the operating context. It, it has been a challenging quarter, uh, though improving. I'll talk about how we're seeing it, but uh, you know there were significant restrictions that were imposed. Uh, we'd spoken about it in April when we had our last call. Uh, as different states went into uh, a staggered phase of lockdowns and restrictions, uh, the second fortnight of April and May were particularly challenged. Uh, with operations being seized across the most of the network. We started to see some signs of easing, uh, easing coming across in June, uh, and it's getting better. The direction of change is getting better as we look into July as well. Business for the most part of the quarter was confined to essentials, which for us was largely the grocery portfolio, not the entire portfolio, because even within our grocery stores, uh, you know, it was only the essentials part of it which could have gotten sold. Uh, and seamless logistics was clearly impacted due to the constraints. And I've got to say that, you know, between wave one and wave two, while supply chains were clearly a lot better prepared, uh, the restrictions that were imposed across the breadth of the country, uh, across the states, meant that there was some impact uh, on mobility and ready logistics, particularly last mile and fulfillment. Uh, across the store network, we had about 26% of our stores that were fully open through the quarter, 35% partially open, which meant that they opened for only uh, certain hours in the day or certain days of the week. Uh, and within that was a story of two parts, grocery partially open for 70% thereabouts and non-grocery stores for about 30 odd percent. Uh, so really 60% uh, the network was opened in some form, whether fully or in part, which compared to about 50% last year. So, so much better trading conditions compared to same time last year. But I think it's important to also point out that whilst the store network was open for this period of time that I just mentioned, the 60 odd percent, uh, you're aware that even for the period of time that they were open, we could only operate for certain hours. So therefore, what we've tried to do is to give you a sense that even though stores are open, they're not really operating at full efficiency at the moment. And so if you look at it across the months, uh, in April, 70 percent uh, was really functional from an operating hours perspective. That went down to 25% in May as more and more restrictions were imposed. Uh, it started to get better uh, in June as there's been progressive easing across the states. Uh, and like I said, as I look at July, 
we are encouraged with the direction of change. It quite hasn't gotten back to the levels of April as yet, but it is trending upwards. Uh, footfalls have dropped to 46%, which is about comparable to the same time last year when wave one struck, uh, but significantly lower uh, than the 88, 90% that we saw in quarter four, which is just about the time that business started to see uh, some level of normalization come back. And consumer sentiment, which uh, which was significantly impacted at the outbreak of, of wave two, you know, latter March, early April, thereabouts, uh, in our in, in in the way we're seeing it, has started to improve and it started to revive. Uh, all that remains very cautious, and therefore, as we see the situation, it's still quite uncertain because uh, many moving parts across the country, across the various states. Uh, but we remain very optimistic, seeing the direction of change in July. Uh, in terms of the key messages, you know, I think I mentioned this the last time around as a retail business with a very, very significant proportion of its team uh, out in the field, out in operations to run the store network, to run our dis distribution centers, our warehouses and our, and our frontline operations on fulfillment. Uh, it was really important to secure our operations and to secure employees. And, uh, you know, as we exited the quarter, we had over 99% of the retail team that have been vaccinated across the breadth of the country. Uh, you know, the last le little bit that's left is really to do with conditions of people who've gone through uh, ailments, gone through medication, and therefore have a lead time before which they get vaccinated. So significant progress in that one. Uh, in terms of business, there's been an uptick of revenues at 32%. You'd see the headline numbers at 22%, but if I stripped out the effect of the petrol retailing business that was transferred out, uh, uh, comparable business, which has continued, is up 32%. Grocery has remained very resilient. Uh, you know, grocery has done well. It served the needs for essentials right through this period ever since COVID, uh, you know, struck us. Uh, but there's been a step up across the other consumption baskets, most notably in fashion and lifestyle and our electronics business, where we've seen better trading conditions relative to same time last year. EBITDA is a tad short of 2,000 crores in this quarter, but up 80% over same time last year, buoyed by the, the revenue build back that has happened on fashion and lifestyle and consumer electronics, and of course, uh, boosted by the investment income that you have now seen for a couple of quarters. Our expansion thrust continues. You know, we were able to commission 123 odd stores, primarily in the month of April, uh, not too much that has happened after that. Uh, but there are about 700 odd stores that are ready, ready to be fitted out and just await commissioning. So as operating curbs are lifted, uh, this will come to market and, and, and get commissioned. And then, of course, there is uh, another pipeline that we have that is in very, various stages of development. Uh, what we've continued to do is to scale up digital commerce and merchant partnerships. And that uh, you will make out from the next chart that I say uh, is standing us in very good stead in times like this. Uh, double clicking on to revenue, uh, so robust revenue performance, 32%, like I said, year on year up, that's excluding the impact of the petrol retailing business that was transferred out. Groceries remain very resilient, uh, you know, it's done well, and it's continued right through uh, from, from quarter one of last year, and, you know, it's, it's continued to uh, to serve the needs of customers, even in a very constrained era. You know, there's a bit of a misnomer saying, but grocery is continuing. Grocery is continue to operate uh, under significant restrictions as well. And that business has been very resilient. There's a build back uh, that has happened on fashion and lifestyle and electronics. And from what you just heard uh, on, on, on the geo numbers and the RGL numbers, clearly connectivity has seen its consistent uptick that has been used to seeing now for some quarters. Uh, here's the big piece which uh, I think we've been investing in and talking about, uh, you know, digital and new commerce has partially alleviated the impact on, on the shutdown of the store network and what was under 5% same time last year and virtually nothing before COVID had struck because the only digital commerce business we had at that point of time was RG on fashion and lifestyle uh, has contributed to about 20% of sales of the retail sales in this quarter. So it gives you a sense of the fact that these revenue streams, which did not exist up to about a year back or 15 months back today, uh, have meaningfully contributed uh, and alleviated the impact of the restrictions that we've been faced with. Petrol retailing, I've just spoken about, you know, that's a drag that we've seen for a few quarters uh, and will be now on the base as we go forward. EBITDA uh, at about 2,000 crores. So so first quarter this year was a little under 2,000 crores, up 80%. Quarter one last year was in the ballpark of, of 1,000 crores. Uh, fashion and lifestyle has been the biggest contributor to this because that's where revenue has come back in some way, uh, you know, clearly on, on, on better trading conditions, although very constrained relative to the last quarter that we saw, which was quarter four, but better than the first quarter of last year when the first set of COVID restrictions were imposed. Uh, electronics has continued to uh, be 
be on momentum done well and on bear trading conditions and higher store days uh, has done has done better this time around. Uh, we've continued to remain uh, razor sharp focused, uh, given that we are a retail business, uh, relatively lower margin business, on on managing our costs, and that's continued to uh, contribute to the resilience of our EBITDA even in times like this, as as revenue has been pulled out. And uh, you know the results continue to have a boost from the investment income. This this quarter has been about 550 odd crores, uh, and we've said this in, uh, in the past that the reason it's here is because over a period of time. As we deploy the resources that we've put in into surplus investments on which we're earning this investment income, we expect it to get replaced uh, by EBITDA from really the new streams of business that we invest in. Um, store expansion, 123. That number could be, uh, well have been over 1,000 this quarter, but like I said, we were constrained. Uh, April was pretty much the only month we could really uh, put up a few stores, 700 in the offing and many more at various stages of development. But the larger message I want to leave with you is that the thrust on expansion continues and very strong emphasis around it. Uh, financial summary, quick headlines. Uh, you know, revenue came in at 38,547. Uh, that was 22% on reported numbers basis. Uh, EBITDA was up 80%, 1941, and profit after tax uh, was uh, more than double over same time last year at 962 crores. Of course, sequential results have been impacted by the fact that I just mentioned significant restrictions. If I just use two data points, we had about 95% of the store network that was operational in quarter four uh, relative to, like I said, 60% between a mix of uh, fully open and partially open and footfalls, which were 88, 90% last quarter were, were close to 45% this quarter. So it gives you a sense that the, the uh, sequential results are not strictly comparable. They're not apples to apples in terms of the operating environment. Uh, to give you a quick sense of the of what's gone behind each of these uh, businesses, so consumer electronics on a year-on-year -year basis is up 1.8x. Uh, you know, uh, the investment that we made to activate Reliance Digital, which is the digital commerce asset that we have for our electronics business, has meant that it has seen the highest ever sales uh, in this quarter. So that's a record on that one, and we continue to grow in momentum on that on that part of the business. Low footfalls for whatever little uh, amount of time that the store network was open. We did see lower footfalls, but those, uh, as has been the case now for a few quarters, uh, was partially offset by higher conversions that we're seeing and, and larger ticket sizes. So across the breadth of our businesses, this is this is a trend that we are seeing. Clearly, conversions are at a much higher than pre-COVID levels, and bill value is clearly trending way above uh, averages of pre-COVID. Uh, this is a business which has invested in, in hooking up its entire network, runs truly omni-channel, so clearly a seamless experience that you run between offline and, omni and online. So omni uh, the entire omni-channel promotions that we ran, uh, the financing tie-ups that we have with banks, uh, very compelling offers, exchange offers, and clearly the strength of partnerships that we have with uh, with brand vendors to really be able to launch a range of products uh, provided the boost to sales so in many ways you know i keep saying this the secret sauce that this business has to do well is continue to play out in this quarter they've just continued to execute really well despite the constraints that they've been faced with broad-based double digit growth across all categories pretty much and i think building on our experience from the last time around this time recognizing that there was uncertainty uh, there was an early uh, uh, phase of execution that we did on air care so that we didn't miss out uh, the summer season. So an early loading and a good early execution and pre-planning that we had done on that category meant that we were able to catch clearly that season. And we continue to build out our own brand's business. Uh, strategically important, we are building out this portfolio. This is anchored around two brands primarily at this stage, which is BPL and Calvinator. And between a mix of the portfolio and its presence across general trade, not just our own stores across general trade, uh, each of those are growing. Looking at fashion and lifestyle, our apparel and footwear business, and this is the one I mentioned, clearly better trading conditions, and I talk about trading conditions and talking about store operation days and footfalls, has meant that this business is 3x over same time last year. Uh, and the business has continued to do well. Regional activation, in-store activations, because here we are, here's where we are challenged, right? We, we're not able to control the footfall because that's restricted and constrained by the context. But as customers come into store, what we're doing is to really uh, activate very impactfully within store. And that's led to higher conversions and higher bill values, at least offsetting, uh, you know, the lower footfalls that we have. Our small town performance has been very resilient. You know, I've said this for a few quarters. It's continued to be to bear out in the current quarter as well. Across the breadth of our business, small towns have been far more resilient. Uh, they did drop 
but clearly not to the extent that some of the larger towns did. Uh, and they're contributing meaningfully to our business right now. And in, in the fashion lifestyle business, for example, the operating metrics, the economics that we have on small towns is clearly well above the average. So very, very encouraging to see that. Uh, and then, of course, the hyper-local capability that we have for fashion lifestyle. You know, we've got, we built out RG in a big way, but now we're building out fashion on Geomart and we've hooked up uh, our trend stores for hyper-local fulfillment. And that's now been extended across 450 odd cities. Uh, Argeo's had a fantastic run. You know, we started to, uh, you know, Argeo in many ways uh, rose to the occasion first quarter last year when the store network in fashion and lifestyle uh, was shut down. Uh, and it has grown ever since, quarter after quarter. Uh, you know, pretty much an improvement on all operating and customer metrics, uh, you know, monthly active users, traffic on site orders, uh, all up 4x, you know, year on year. And uh, the point I think I mentioned the last time around, we're growing momentum on this business significantly. Uh, you know, the revenue that we clock uh, per quarter on Argeo now is equal to the revenue that we did uh, for a full year in the period pre-COVID. Yeah, so that's the business which has continued to be on momentum uh, and is now contributing very meaningfully to, to our apparel and footwear business. Uh, successful execution of events and with each event, clearly operating metrics getting better and, and customer metrics getting larger. And we've ramped up capacities. And this is the next thing that we're now investing in significantly. So whether it is last mile fulfillment, whether it is supply chain or distribution center capacity or fulfillment center capacity, uh, or it is indeed the technology platform, we're now investing really for new peaks that we are starting to see on this business. And on merchant partnerships, we're scaling up. Of course, we were constrained. Many markets across the country were shut down because of the restrictions and these were fashion and lifestyle markets uh, clearly not uh, deemed to be essentials uh, but as markets opened out in june uh, we started to bring the business back we're currently present in a little under 2400 cities poised for further expansion uh, in the months ahead as markets start to open out and we expand the portfolio we're doing everything that is required from a capability standpoint right on assortment right on seller onboarding uh, to prepare this business for significant expansion in the months ahead on jewels, uh, I think jewels has had a has had a very good run. Uh, revenues are up two and a half times over same time last year. Higher operating days, but importantly, I think we think better product mix. Uh, you know, more jewelry, lesser gold coins, uh, and that always augurs well. Uh, of course, uh, you know, when when sentiment is a bit weak, diamond contribution does take a beating, uh, as it is uh, as it did in the case of uh, you know quarter one last year as well. So diamond contributions come off a bit, but the good part is within gold. We're seeing uh, uh, a better mix, which is veering more towards jewelry, less towards just uh, you know holding gold coins. Uh, we continue to leverage design capabilities. Collections are doing well, well received. The virtual gold voucher facility that we we uh, we pioneered was to really be able to lock in gold for customers who couldn't visit stores but wanted to lock in the price at that point of time, and then they would redeem it. Uh, you know, once stores open, that was met with a very encouraging response. And I think Reliance Jewels continues to receive. Uh, a lot of external acclaim. It's now something that we've seen for many quarters and uh, just reflects the way this business is being built out. On a luxury and premium brands business, uh, clearly uh, the emphasis on digital commerce, uh, which is now about 30% of this business, has really been able to salvage revenues at a time when most of this store network is shut down. A large part of the store network is in malls, which still remain shut. Uh, we continue to expand the portfolio. Argeo Lux, which I'm hoping many of you would have experienced by now, uh, you know, the offering on that uh, from our premium and our luxury brands has been extended uh, and there's more in the offering. Uh, you know, strong rebound on Hamleys as 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 UK is reopened. Uh, but let's recognize that a lot of the traffic that we saw in the UK business was really domestic traffic. The foreign tourists into UK, which is also a sizable contributor to the Hamleys UK business, has not yet happened. But at least uh, we've seen a good rebound uh, from the domestic traffic on, on the UK uh, Hamleys business. And we continue to expand the partnerships. And this time around, we've announced a joint venture with the creative artist agency in the global brands group which is really brand management companies which will just expand the portfolio that we have uh, under this business uh, on grocery i mentioned very resilient double digit growth in the continuing business uh, you know the quarter on quarter performance was impacted by operating restrictions because it is a bit of a misnomer to say that you know grocery uh, did not see any uh, any any constraints the reality is the grocery network was also subjected to the same limitations on operating hours and the restrictions on portfolios that could be sold. So the quarter on quarter performance uh, uh, clearly was impacted, but it remains resilient otherwise. Uh, 
in terms of the essentials part of the portfolio. Our stores were reorganized to ensure that wherever footfall was happening, you know, we were absolutely offering a safe uh, shopping environment, broad-based growth across categories, typical categories that, that do, do well in times like this and led the performance was staples, processed foods, and parts of the HBC business. Uh, we've continued to leverage relationships with key vendors to ensure better availability. And I did mention that supply chains were not as broken as they might have been given the suddenness uh, uh, of, of the first wave last year. Clearly, uh, between partners and ourselves, we were completely as a network better prepared uh, and that just ensured better availability this time around. And we worked very closely with them on activations and promotions to really bring the best to customers. Uh, we continue to focus. It's, an, it's a strong emphasis and a strong priority within the business to now build uh, our own brand portfolio over here. And you know, we've now had the launch of uh, our own brand called Puric, uh, Puric Insta Safe, which is built around the proposition of hygiene. Uh, and we're now looking to extend that into general trade uh, as we scale up our new commerce business. Uh, Geomart uh, has really came in many ways to the rescue. You just heard me make an overarching point saying that in a quarter when the store network was stifled, uh, digital commerce and new commerce uh, in many ways contributed to about 20% of the business. Geomart continues to scale up further. Geomart just about completed a year. It was it was born in, in, in May of last year and it's grown from strength to strength. It's continued to grow scale. Uh, orders on Geomart have been up uh, 25% quarter over quarter, which means over the last quarter as well. So there is continuing momentum that we are seeing on Geomart and very high levels of repeat. You know, we're seeing over 75% uh, of uh, repeats uh, on Geomart, which is which is uh, very, very healthy uh, over it. And we've now extended coverage uh, to about 218 cities. And our Kirana partnerships are up by a third over the same time, uh, you know, last quarter. Uh, sorry, over, over last quarter. And, uh, you know, we continue now to build capabilities for faster onboarding. So as, as curbs are lifted, uh, we, you could expect a rapid uh, acceleration of our onboarding on Kirana Partners. Uh, so therefore, looking ahead, you know, uh, let me again say it's a big priority for the retail business, uh, given given uh, you know the dispersion and 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 where our employees are working clearly in front line uh, to continue and finish this whole journey on vaccination. So therefore, vaccinating employees, uh, fam uh, you know, their families and partners. Uh, and securing operations uh, is clearly a foremost priority. We clearly a lot of them will fall due for their second shot uh, over the next few weeks. But we remain very steadfast and committed uh, to our uh, our medium term and uh, immediate term uh, priorities, which is to accelerate uh, the new store opening. Uh, you know that's taken a bit of a it's been stalled by by clearly the operating restrictions. We're looking to get back to that as 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 markets open and as operating curbs are lifted. Scaling up digital commerce, we think it's a way of life. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and and we're therefore preparing for this and we're expanding capacity. Geomart will continue to expand its play. Uh, we we meant we've spoken about uh, how we taking it horizontal across categories and how we're growing the assortment on Geomart. We will continue to grow new commerce partnerships across businesses and across geographies. And there's enough preparedness right from infrastructure to teams that are now in place to really be able to enable this. Uh, launch and scale up new businesses, Geomart Digital, uh, which is our foreign new commerce uh, in the electronic space, uh, is, is due for launch. Uh, in, in, in the months ahead, subscription services is very much in the offing. Building up uh, the marketplace uh, is in the works. Expanding beauty uh, uh, is, is clearly in the offing. And then newer businesses that we had acquired, which is Urban Ladder and Zimame, very much uh, uh, you know, uh, being invested in and in, in plans that we have to exponentially grow each of them. Uh, an integral part of the priorities within the retail business is to really also build the larger ecosystem and what we're doing is to expand design centers and and really look to see how we invest in design research and development uh, across across the country and, and there's a fair amount of work that we've progressed in in that direction that is awaiting execution and we're looking to develop the vendor ecosystem and fast track uh, the supply chain infrastructure augmentation which again has been stored by the current circumstances but for which a lot of readiness has been built uh, and we will execute, therefore, uh, as, as the situation eases out and normalizes. Uh, and last week, we announced uh, the acquisition of a controlling interest uh, in, uh, in, in Just Dial. Uh, and we're very excited about that, that acquisition in the context of uh, uh, the larger retail priorities and how we're going to be building up new commerce and, and, and the retail plans. Uh, there is 
uh, uh, some part of the process of the acquisition which needs to be completed over the next couple of months. And as we do that alongside, business teams are engaging on how we can really leverage uh, this acquisition for the retail plans and, and uh, really grow the business. Uh, so very exciting space, uh, and, and that's really going to be a priority for us over the next few months. So let me end by saying, you know, uh, that that we remain uh, very optimistic uh, about the direction of change. Uh, you know, many moving parts, but clearly uh, July has been a better month than than June in the first 20 days that, that we've seen it. Uh, you know, in terms of store operations, it's a tad lower than where where April might have been, but it's trending upwards and, and, and we're very optimistic with that direction. Uh, and we remain very strongly committed and confident to be able to restore uh, the growth momentum that you've been used to seeing in the Reliance retail business uh, in the pre-pandemic era as soon as uh, operating conditions normalize. With that, thank you. And let me hand it over to Sanjay. Sanjay, over to you. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, on the oil and gas segment, uh, the you know as you are aware, we uh, commissioned the R cluster field in December of last year, the satellite cluster field uh, in April of this year. On the back of that, uh, the production ramp up uh, is underway, and we are very much on track. Uh, we in the quarter gone by, we produced about 36 PCFE which is actually almost at par with what we had produced in the entire year of FI, in FI20. Uh, based on the strong production growth, uh, we are now seeing revenues at 10 quarter highs and EBITDA at 22 quarter highs. Um, as you're aware, uh, we have now achieved a uh, aggregate production of about 80, 18 million standard cubic meters, which is slightly ahead of our plans. And uh, in, in, as part of our monetization, we had conducted uh, four rounds of bidding, uh, one round for CVM and three rounds for KGD6. You know, we pioneered the auction process uh, in India for domestically produced gas. Uh, and we have successfully con contracted uh, 18 million standard cubic meters of gas. Uh, what we saw was, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, the demand levels have uh, been restored to the pre-COVID levels. And uh, there has been uh, strong, intense competition in the auctions. Um, uh, you had participants from the fertilizer, power, steel, uh, as well as pet uh, uh, refining and petrochemicals and resellers. So all in all, you know, there was intense competition and we, we were quite pleased with the outcomes. Uh, now, uh, with, with the strong rally in gas prices, we expect that uh, you know we should at least have a 50 to 60 percent uh, increase in gas prices starting from the next half onwards. So that's that's the outlook. Again, uh, you know, um, many good triggers. We believe that gas has an important role to play as we transition uh, towards uh, decarbonization. So uh, that's that's the outlook. Uh, and uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So, so just as a comparison, I was as I was mentioning earlier. So in FI20, we produced about 39 BCFE. As compared to that, in the first quarter of uh, this year itself, we've uh, produced 36 uh, BCFE. So, so, so that's the kind of growth, and uh, we expect to sustain this growth uh, and augment it uh, with time. Uh, most of the production has 95% of the production has been from KGD6. Currently, we are contributing nearly 20% of India's gas production. Next slide, please. All right, so on the basis of this production growth, we can now see the top line growth uh, in uh, you know, the revenues are you know, at highs uh, when we look over the last, uh, on a quarterly basis over the last 10 quarters. And um, similarly, EBITDA margins will continue to improve. We've seen an improvement of almost 940 basis points uh, uh, key on Q, but this will continue to improve as we see uh, the increase in production and increase in prices and the operating efficiencies uh, that uh, we expect uh, will play out uh, to improve the EBITDA margins. Um, once again, you know, the whole uh, point out here is that prices are expected uh, to improve uh, based on the sustained rally in gas prices. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, you know we expect that from next half onwards, uh, 
we should get a higher realizations battles 50 to 60 percent in kgd6 next slide please uh, the KGD6 MJ field, uh, which is currently under development, uh, this is a, not a deep water field, it's a gas content, condensate field. Uh, it comprises of wells uh, uh, connected to a subsea production system, which is tied back to a floating production storage and offloading vessel. Uh, now, all of this is currently underway. Our second offshore installation campaign will commence from later this year, around November. And our well campaign is development well campaign is currently underway. Uh, we, the drilling and completions is under, underway right now. And the, both the FPSO as well as the subsea uh, production system is on track for first gas uh, in the third quarter of FY23. Now, with the augmentation of production from MJ field, we expect to cross the 30 million standard cubic meter mark from KGD6 by 2023. So that's, that's the production outlook. Meanwhile, uh, we are also making efforts uh, to consolidate, you know, uh, our, in and leverage our understanding of uh, the basin, uh, the geology, and even leverage the existing deep water infrastructure we have. So uh, we're looking at exploration uh, prospects uh, in, in the block KGUDW1, uh, which we expect to mature this fiscal and potentially look at it at drilling. If, if successful, we can now, we can uh, tie it back to our existing infrastructure. So that's the outlook in terms of uh, the future growth. Thank you. Over to you, Shrikant. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is the last uh, section from a business standpoint uh, on, on what to see. The environment, uh, uh, as you know, uh, consumer sentiment has been rising. The vaccination drive uh, and monetary policy support uh, has meant uh, you're seeing it in uh, the global oil demand, which went up by 1.2 million uh, barrels per day on a Q on Q basis. Um, also, we saw similar uh, trends in demand for both polymer and polyester, uh, more so because of uh, demand in US and Europe. Uh, mobility indices wise, it's at 88 percent now, uh, uh, you know, 88 percent of the pre pandemic level uh, in early part of Jan, it was uh, closer to 60 percent. So uh, you can see the uh, the demand there and the mobility there. Um, Q and Q demand uh, was impacted by second wave. And uh, as I will try to make a case in the subsequent part of the presentation that uh, that the demand for both polymer and polyester were uh, significantly uh, lower than what we saw in the first quarter of uh, FI21. Um, but when you look at it uh, from a year-on-year growth for oil uh, up 19%, uh, polymer uh, demand up 28%, polyester up about you know 200% plus. Uh, also, it is reflected in operating rates. If you see the cracker operating rates globally, uh, it was at uh, 82% slightly higher than what it was in the previous quarter. And we saw that even in the refining operating rates uh, at 76% uh, versus 74%. Uh, uh, so clearly, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, the demand environment and increased mobility is uh, showing in as far as the business is concerned. So when you look at the feedstock price environment, uh, again, uh, you saw oil close to 69. This is the average price up 13% Q on Q. This is 11 quarter high. Um, it was, uh, you know, obviously uh, supported because of uh, global fuel demand and also uh, supply management by OPEC plus. Uh, we also saw that translate in terms of uh, higher uh, cracker feedstock prices, both NAFTA and ethane were up between eight to 9%. Uh, also, uh, you know, um, the prices were uh, higher because crackers started operation post the Arctic freeze. Um, the, uh, uh, we continue to see uh, global supply chains being impacted uh, with high sea freight and container shortages. Uh, when you look at uh, the product margin environment, uh, you know, um, you can see that in the margins again, the transportation fuels at uh, four to six quarter high. We are also seeing uh, it in the uh, downstream petrochemicals where uh, year on year PVC delta up 43%, polypropylene is up about 15%. Uh, PTA is 72%, PX 14%. So uh, a strong uh, rebound in as far as the margin is concerned. 
So this was the slide I was referring to. So if you look at the numbers on the left, um, we have plotted the deltas for P, PVC and PP, and these are really the bar. Uh, these are the bar uh, graphs, and uh, we have plotted the demand from a uh, um, uh, demand on the left hand side and deltas on the right hand side. But uh, the demand is really versus the pre-COVID, which is the fourth quarter of FI20. So if you were to see a uh, first quarter of FI21 uh, demand, the weighted average demand. Uh, you know, dropped by 25% uh, in first quarter of FI21. But when you look at it, uh, in first quarter of FI22, the demand is down by 15%. Uh, but I would like to highlight that despite the Q1, Q fall, you can see that uh, demand is almost at the pre-COVID levels. And uh, uh, again, when you see the year on year, the growth is about 28%. And we have seen it in the demand coming through in uh, health and hygiene, in FMCG, in packaging, in polypropylene with uh, poly polypropylene copolymer for oxygen concentrators. And uh, when you see the delta, uh, you can see that quarter on quarter PVC deltas have been uh, actually stable, flat, I would say, uh, while PP and uh, PE deltas are down between 6 to 13 uh, percent. But still, year on year, if you were to see, um, uh, um, the deltas are actually 30 to 40 percent higher than the pre-COVID uh, levels, and uh, this is further aided by the fact that uh, it is coming on the back rather of uh, global uh, recovery, and also the fact that uh, logistic constraints are are uh, helping uh, maintain these kind of uh, deltas. And when you look at standalone products like P, uh, PP and PVC, they are uh, well above the five-year uh, averages that we have seen. In, in polyester, actually, you can see the more starker. Uh, uh, you know, in the first quarter of FI21, you saw that uh, demand had uh, effectively collapsed by 72%. But in this quarter, that is a one quarter FI22, you can see that the fall is only 30%. And even though it is 84% of pre-COVID, but uh, you can see the sharp growth uh, versus uh, same time last year. So that's in that sense, the growth has been 203%. Uh, PT, uh, uh, you know, demand uh, continued to be impacted by lockdowns. In, this, in fact, this will be the second consecutive summer season where it has got impacted. On the, uh, uh, however, when you look at the deltas, it is very interesting because you see that uh, the deltas um, have, in fact, uh, were uh, on fourth quarter FI20 and first quarter 21 were were flat at 540, uh, and then when you compare it to year on year, it has seen a 15% year on year growth. And uh, in the first wave, uh, when uh, you know demand collapsed, yet you saw that deltas were maintained because China inventory buildup of both PX and uh, PTA, uh, you know they did that with, because it was driven by low absolute prices. So so therefore uh, prices really didn't fall. Similarly, in the second wave too, while uh, uh, you know uh, deltas have got maintained because uh, you know there has been a strong growth in polyester chain margins, uh, polyester chain. Yeah, in in China. So so therefore the uh, prices remained uh, the chain deltas have remained uh, you know in that sense flat. And now the broader polyester market integrated chain margins are uh, are actually now approaching uh, five year averages. On the uh, uh, on the fuel on the fuel demand side, you can see that uh, if I were to work with third quarter FI20 as the base, because for transportation fuel that is a better proxy of pre COVID levels. Um, you can see that uh, by uh, um, you can see that uh, gasoline is almost 97%. Gas oil is at about 94% of pre-COVID. Clearly, ATF at 62%, uh, you know, uh, is is a little far away from that kind of number. Uh, and you uh, may noted that the global uh, mobility indices uh, are only about 12% lower from uh, lower than where they were pre-COVID. And um, you are seeing gasoline, gasoline and gas oil demand uh, uh, coming up. As I said, there is uh, increased uh, leisure travel pushing up hotel room rates and gasoline demand in the U.S. And when you look at some of the data on uh, domestic air travel in the U.S., they have actually uh, come back to the March 2020 levels. Uh, the clear driver for uh, demand is going to be still um, uh, jet fuel, which is still 30. 8% uh, away from the uh, levels in pre-COVID, uh, but as uh, but as the economies open up, um, you know you you should see a bounce back there. 
this is just a pictorial uh, representation of uh, you know the uh, direct relation between uh, mobility and uh, transportation uh, cracks and in all the three geographies europe uh, us and uk uh, as the sharp rebound uh, uh, you can see the sharp rebound in uh, mobility and you can also see corresponding uh, cracks uh, go up and um, both gasoline is now uh, is a six quarter high uh, also gas oil is also seen uh, uh, quarter on quarter improvement but um, uh, but you know the fact that there is weak atf means that uh, it does weigh uh, on on uh, on uh, gas oil cracks uh, ATF also, while it's on a lower base, you did see a quarter and quarter improvement uh, with, uh, with domestic travel in both uh, US and Europe. So bringing it together, uh, overall, uh, you see that uh, revenues uh, sharply at a lakh and 3,000 crores is sharply higher than where we saw in first quarter. EBITDA, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, higher by almost 50% year on year and, and it's about 7.2% higher on a quarter on quarter basis. There has been a margin expansion, uh, uh, you know, by almost 60 basis points. Uh, this is on the back of uh, transportation fuel cracks. Uh, it is also on the back of uh, Q on Q improvement in deltas, especially PXPT and YAN. Um, also for us, the feedstock flexibility that is NAFTA versus E10 helped. Um, the fact that we are accessing uh, enhanced domestic gas also helped reduce our energy cost. We are working at, uh, you know, full capacity. And most importantly, we were able to flex uh, our business model from domestic back to exports, similar in some sense to what we did in first quarter of FI21. Here, uh, uh, just on the operating performance side, uh, you know, we, our throughputs were indeed higher by 1.6% on a Q on Q basis. We did maximize uh, straight run fuel oil and also some of the arbitrage barrels uh, from a cost point of view. We did have an unplanned uh, FCCU shortage, which which impacted gasoline uh, PEPP, but uh, you know then FCCU restarted and and as and as uh, uh, normalized. Uh, uh, as a strategy, we did uh, push more of jet fuel because um, you know there was a, a sequential improvement in demand, so we, we focused on that. And as I mentioned earlier on, the placement in export markets uh, helped mitigate the consumption in the domestic market. I also did want to take a second to to uh, really uh, highlight the uh, extraordinary work by our Jamnagar team uh, in as far as medical uh, grade oxygen is concerned. Yeah, uh, they were able to meet the daily requirements of almost 100,000 patients during uh, peak COVID. Um, you know, they uh, were, uh, you know, the air separation units operations were increased. Um, we also curtailed our gasifier operations to maximize oxygen production. And uh, we didn't even hesitate for a fraction of a second uh, to substitute that by imported LNG. So uh, the, this has been something which has given us uh, great satisfaction to be of a small help in, uh, you know, in this second wave of COVID. Um, on the near term drivers, uh, you know, we do see, uh, you know, oil demand, but still going to be in, uh, you know, short of uh, what it was in terms of peak. Um, and also the global polyolefin uh, uh, supply is coming through, but we, we are confident that uh, strong Asian demand will absorb this. And uh, as vaccination pace increases and uh, COVID containment happens, it will drive uh, consumer confidence. On the margin side, uh, you know, the reduction in Chinese export quota, uh, as well as demand uh, recovery, especially in the US, uh, we believe will uh, support uh, gasoline margins. The, the international logistics constraints uh, uh, continue, and in that sense, it is adding its bit in terms of maintaining some of the uh, margin there. And uh, we continue to be very constructive on the polyester chain uh, integrated deltas. On the demand driver side, uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, all linked to mobility, uh, road, air, uh, as and when, uh, uh, which will which will pull demand up. Um, from the domestic side, uh, we are seeing across the board demand in healthcare, food packaging, FMCG, and as far as uh, our petrochemicals are concerned, and also PE and PVC uh, uh, continue uh, to benefit from some of the uh, favorable policy initiatives. Of course, from a you know from from uh, what we have to look out for is uh, clearly if there are more uh, uh, lockdowns, uh, especially uh, in Southeast Asia. 
uh, yeah, that could have an impact. Uh, similarly, domestic side, if there were fresh restrictions, yes, the, those things could be uh, uh, could have an impact in as far as the pace in which you will get it back. Uh, also, very high crude prices uh, 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 and oil prices can can have an impact on demand, but they will have to watch that. In uh, I'll just bring all this together uh, in a summary. Um, uh, you know, this quarter uh, it's a record EBITDA. Uh, overall, when we put all the business businesses together, I would say the minimal uh, the impact of second wave has been uh, minimal uh, on financial performance, and uh, with overall uh, global uh, mobility expected to improve. Uh, you know, we do expect um, uh, you know demand to remain firm, and in, that is the context in which we remain uh, constructive about both the demand and margin environment. Uh, as Sanjay highlighted, the oil and gas is poised to be a significant uh, uh, value and uh, and uh, and growth in the coming years. Um, Geo uh, will is continue to uh, uh, will continue its leadership position with new offerings in both the Geo Phone Next, the Geo Fiber, as well as enterprises business, and not to not to uh, forget mentioning about 5G. On the retail side, uh, we are positioned for strong recovery uh, led by digital commerce. Sanjay talked about the fact that between digital and uh, some of the new merchants, uh, it's now close to 20% versus what it was as 4%. We are also adding stores, and uh, you know uh, we are seeing a revivals, a strong revival. We expect in consumer sentiments, and uh, our focus now is on an accelerated start. To the clean and green energy business initiative that uh, you know that we announced in, de uh, in great detail in our uh, AGM speech. So, in all in all, a diversified uh, portfolio across consumption baskets, baskets, a very strong balance sheet uh, it underpins uh, our uh, uh, robust outlook for growth in uh, in our for our. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you all for being on the call. Thank you, Shikant. Thank you. Yeah.